angels and shepherds, a baby in a cattle stall, Mary and Joseph, the whole menagerie are so very familiar to us that we could put on a costume and act out any one of those characters. And many of us as children probably did exactly that. We know the Christmas story, the nativity story so well that if I were to choose any other subject for today's sermon, you'd probably wonder, well, why? After all, this is Christmas Eve. This is December 24. Either we go, tell it on the mountain, or we go home, right? The fact is, in our day, a whole lot of attention on Christmas Eve is given over to looking for Santa Claus to arrive carrying gifts for good little girls and boys. I read in the Alpena News that NORAD, the uh, radar system of our Air Force, goes online tracking the jolly old elf and his sleigh full of toys pulled by eight tiny reindeer, the front one with a bl bright blinking red nose like a strobe light out front. Church-going folks like us, however, remember that Jesus is the reason for the season. We may deck the halls and lovely job here. We may drink wassail and sing jingle bells right along with the rest of our society. And there's nothing wrong with any of that frivolity and festivity. But we also remember that this is the advent of the Messiah. This is the coming of the Christ. This is the birth of God's own son, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus. Now, since the Jews believed that their long-awaited Messiah would come from the line of King David and would come from the city of David, Zion, would assume the throne of David to reign in glory in Jerusalem, since they assumed all that, one would think the eyes of the waiting world would be upon the royal palace in Jerusalem or in the temple dedicated to the God of Israel. If they're looking for God's Messiah, all the tradition said that's where he's going to arrive not in some little village, Bethlehem, five miles away behind some hills upon which hardworking shepherds were keeping watch. And furthermore, if a ruler was expected to appear, if push came to shove, the odds would be in favor, favor of King Herod the Great and all of his henchmen, or Caesar Augustus and the Roman legionnaires. They would win the day if you're looking for a powerful Messiah, not some obscure infant born to a homeless couple living in a barn. And yet the Christmas story reminds us that God is found in unexpected places, not necessarily where the media is focused its attention, and not in the halls of political power and military might. No, God is found among ordinary people like us. The Christmas story as it's told in the churches also reminds us that God's greatest work begins in a tiny way, with all the fragility of a newborn baby, with all the sensitivity of newborn baby flesh. Now, I don't know why that should surprise us. After all, it seems to me all the big things of nature have little beginnings, right? Atoms and molecules, seeds, embryos. Furthermore, history teaches us that big events always have little beginnings. So why does the Christmas surprise us that God would come among us and be with us in a form that is so ordinary and humble and beneath the NORAD radar? It may be because we are accustomed to equating bigness with power, right? Big names, big money, big business, big government. They always seem to get their way in the world. They get the big incomes, they get the big tax cuts, right? They get the big media attention, while common folks feel so small so often. It must have felt that way to Joseph and Mary, caught in the pinchers between politics and religion, as we spoke about last Sunday when Marilyn Kettler read that very same text to us. Under the edict from Rome to register themselves for the census, Joseph and Mary pushed themselves, despite the fact she was in her ninth month of pregnancy, pushed themselves over 80 miles from Nazareth to arrive unwelcomed in Bethlehem, shut out from the only inn in town, surrounded by grunting barn animals, desperate sweating cries, labor pains. There was no doctor on call. 
There was no midwife nurse. There was no clean sheet, no running water. And it was nighttime, all right, but I, I don't think it felt all that holy of a night. And it sure wasn't a silent night. Just after the commotion of the birth, some shepherds arrived, according to Luke's gospel, as Jim McNeil read it for us this morning. Unwashed, unlearned, unexpected common folks, laborers from the field. Probably not the kind of bedside help that Mary and Joseph would have looked for. And shortly thereafter, we are told in Matthew's gospel, some foreign wise men came on their quest looking for the Christ child, leaving gifts behind, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then with them came the warning that King Herod's troops, the occupying army, they were hunting the child as well. In January, we will talk about how the baby Jesus and his parents narrowly escaped a terrorist massacre in Bethlehem. Going on back then, going on now. The point is, when all the parts of the Christmas story come together, without the romantic music and the sentiment of the season, we have a picture of people who have been caught by surprise, far from their homes, dislocated, and then refugees. The nativity is a story of faithful, humble people who are swept up in moral confusion and physical suffering and chaos in the streets and talk of divorcing and harsh poverty and clashing expectations. If you were gonna plan for the birth of the Messiah, a long-awaited, hope-for savior, a prince of peace, you'd probably do it a little differently, wouldn't you? Why should God break into this weary world of sin at the most raw and helpless, powerless underbelly of poverty instead of in halls of power where we're looking for a change? Why come to people like them or like us who are so poorly prepared, who are rushing about with all kinds of other agenda on our to-do list and who are, oh, so tired? I think it's because that's where we need the Christmas message more than any other time. We need reminders of the Christmas story when we're tired from our own traveling, when we're wearied from the physical burdens and the emotional pressures that we are under, when we are morally confused about who really is in charge of this world. That's when we need the Christmas message, the Christ to be born in us anew. We need the Christmas story for ourselves when we are most like Joseph and Mary, feeling left out, feeling shut out, feeling like we've been thrown to the animals, right? We need the Christmas message when our hopes for a meaningful career have been reduced to bare subsistence, just barely getting by. And so we see ourselves like the shepherds in that story, common laborers who are punching the time clock and keeping night watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, always on the job trying to make ends meet. Why would God break into our weary world at the point of its most raw birth pains with infant helplessness and the scandal of an unwed pregnancy and the powerlessness of homelessness and poverty instead of in the halls of power and economic security? I think it's because God graciously chooses us to meet us in the world right where we are just as we are, real people in this re weary world. And we don't have to try to block out the hectic pace of the holidays. We don't have to try to block out the chaotic emotions or the sputtering of the politicians or the tragic reality of life and death that goes on around us in order to feel Christmas. Because Christmas is born in our stable-like, sullied lives. Christmas is born in us at the time when we are feeling that raw hopelessness, helplessness, and saying, save me, deliverer, Jesus. It, it's precisely where God comes nearest, is when we are most in need, when we are feeling more aggrieved, when we are in our own pain, and we say we reach out. It used to be said because of World War I that there's never a, a atheist in a foxhole, because when the gas is coming and the bullets are flying, you say, God, help me, be here, be near. It's right where we feel like we're small or helpless, into the smelly and grunting dark corners of a stable-like life, the Christ comes. 
in infant tenderness and nearness. In that carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, we hear these words, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of heaven. No ear may hear Christ's coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. To a world overwhelmed by big problems and big powers, deafened by big noises and by big mouths, it's surprising to realize that when God begins to do something in history-making proportion, it starts in a way that still seems so weak, so foolish, so fragile, so small, infant-sized, a spark in the darkness. See, the signs of God's great saving work in the coming of Jesus Christ are not big and loud and hard and strong. They're soft. They're as soft as a baby's skin, as soft as the brush of angels' wings. Christmas says God is here. God is near. God is nearby. God is in our life. And when we feel that, we feel Christmas. And right where we need it the most, that's our prayer. So my prayer for you is that this Christmas you can feel that infant embryo. You can feel that spark in the dark. You can feel that new possibility arising so that your new year will truly be a year where we can say, yes, peace on earth, goodwill to all. Amen. <laughs>